Welcome to The Mushroom's Apprentice. I'm your host, Shona Home. My guest today is Robert Phoenix. Robert has been a sought after astrologist for over 12 years. His Virgo son fuels his desire to be in service, coupled with searingly astute observational skills, thanks to his Scorpio rising. His influences range from Dane Rudyard and Joseph Campbell to Carl Jung and William Blake. Trained by trans medium Karen Lundegaard, Robert began as a working psychic and tarot reader during the 90s. He weaves his intuitive gifts into his readings as well as his observations of the greater world stage. You can listen to Robert's observations on his daily podcast, 15minutesofflame.com, and that's 15 minutes OV, not OF, 15 minutes OV flame.com. And you can also tune into his excellent shows on YouTube. Sunday night Astro Live takes, uh, takes place on Sunday evenings. And that's where Robert breaks down the weekly celestial influences. And then there is the Friday Farcast where Robert interviews other brilliant voices who share their commentary on what's going on in our world. Now, some of Robert's most accurate predictions were the Anthony Weiner scandal, the election of Donald Trump, the death of David Bowie, the calamitous shutdown of the Western world via COVID-19 as it emerged from China in January of 2020, broad social changes based on cycles and generational astrology, his predictive abilities coupled with connecting the dots between astrology and culture got the attention of the Gaia Network, where he co-produced and presented 25 episodes of The 11th House, which is still one of Gaia's most watched presentations on astrology. He's also appeared on Open Minds with Regina Meredith, providing quarterly forecasts with her since 2015. Robert has been reading for me for the last decade, and I tell you, his readings are thorough and his insights and observations are so astute and bang on, but it's not only his readings, it's his observations of what's happening in the world at large through the lens of astrology that has impressed me greatly over the years. You can book a reading with Robert through his website, robertphoenix.com. And I'll just finish by saying that Robert is also a man of integrity and heart, and I am so excited to share him with you today. So so welcome, Robert. Hey, Shauna. Uh, it's great to be here with you. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm glad you're doing this podcast. It's cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, I'm enjoying myself. So I really, I really want to bring people who I so admire to uh, the folks that uh, are following my work. And, and you have played a big role. So maybe you could start by just talking about how you got into this in the first place. What what drew you to astrology? It's kind of an interesting journey. When I was a kid, I was always into like sort of out there, cutting edge, sort of sci-fi, mystical things, for lack of a better term. So it, it wasn't necessarily astrology related, but... I was, you know, I was very into like science fiction and uh, I was, a, I was a, a Star Trek kid. So I grew up watching the, the Star Trek series on TV. So I was, so that world was really intriguing to me, right? Like what's out there, you know, cosmic connections. I was very, as from a young child, at a young age, I was really into UFOs. Um, a lot of it had to do with what was going on culturally too, right? But not everybody was attracted to it. I thought it was really interesting. And uh, so I had this kind of thirst for for knowledge and trying to understand like unseen worlds. Uh, and that came on at a pretty early age. So when I, as I, as I got older, I got more... Um, I don't know, drawn towards these topics. And I remember, I think it was in the sixth grade and I, there was there was a classroom that had some books in it. And one of the books was Psychic Secrets Behind the Iron Curtain. And so I, I picked up this book and, you know, I didn't have the patience to read through it, but there were pictures of curling photography and really early stuff and, you know, uh, energy emanating from fingers. I thought, wow, this is, this is, I'm like, I'm really into this. This is like what I want, in a lot of ways, what I want my life to be about. And I think it was right around the, maybe a little bit later, 
uh, my father and I started to, my father and I watched In Search of Ancient Astronauts. The There was a, like, a two-part series on, I think it was NBC, Eric Von Donneken, right? So we got into the ancient astronauts thing, thing together. So I started to kind of look again at like space and, you know, my father was reading the Bible and trying to, you know, decipher the Bible and try to figure out what was going on. So we kind of got into it together and I, and I actually did a lecture on it for my eighth grade class and the uh, teacher who was going to, take over the class for the next um, session. Saw He came in early, he saw me do it. He said, hey, could you come give that lecture to my class, right? I'm like, yeah, sure, why not, right? So, I mean, that's kind of been the backstory for me uh, in terms of trying to understand like what's going on in terms of things we don't normally see or perceive or understand in our own limited way. So the the astrology stuff, and I it was always kind of in the background. I remember, I think somebody had a copy of Linda Goodman's Sun Signs. It might have been my parents, although they didn't read it. They weren't into it. But I remember kind of checking it out, reading it. Well, this is interesting. And my my knowledge of astrology was really limited. Like I knew I was a Virgo and whatever that meant. But then later on, when, when I went through this period we had this awakening through a dark night of the soul moment. And a lot of things started to happen to me that were, you know, really off the charts. And, and, and I would say in a good way. And then it eventually led me to go to this place called Findhorn, which is this, you know, community, right? Intentional community. In Scotland. In, in Scotland, right. And, and it was really spurred on uh, for me by watching my dinner with Andre because they talk about Fintorn and I'm like, Oh, I want to go to this place. It sounds really cool. Right. So I graduated from college and then I went to Fintorn, but before I went there, I was part of this group that was traveling to these intentional communities. It was a program through the university of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And the, there was a teacher there who put together this, this group. And I found out about it because I subscribed to New Age Magazine. And there was an ad in the back of New Age Magazine. I'm thinking, well, I want to do something after college. What do I want to do? And so in that New Age Magazine, there were two ads in the back. One was for this journey to Findhorn. And the other was to hang out in the caves of Lascaux with Robert Bly. And, and, I, and I thought about that one too, because that sounded pretty interesting. But Finhorn really aligned with the with the uh, my dinner with Andre stuff. So I took out a loan, and I you know it was enough for the to pay for the course and all the other stuff that I needed. And so I went right. And the first stop was Wisconsin, which was this uh, professor Belden Paulson, who was a wonderful man. He's a cancer, and he and his wife Lisa started a little intentional community called high wind up in the Kettle Moraine area. And Lisa had been to Findhorn. So she wanted to do the, the Wisconsin version of it. And while I was there, there was a woman there who was an astrologer her, and her name was Susan. And so she, this was a really early computer program printout. So she printed my chart. It was the first time I had, I had seen my chart. I'm like, well, what is this? I, I want to know more about it. And so I, I, Went to Findhorn, eventually went to another community called uh, Sirius in Massachusetts. And so I came back from Findhorn and the whole trip, you know, was part of a, about a two year journey, just having my mind blown every single day. And it played a big, it was a big, big part of, of my journey at that time. So I came back and I'm like, okay, well, I, I want more tools to make sense of what's going on or how to kind of navigate reality. And I sort of systematically started going through these, these systems. And I think the first one I got into was looking back on, it, I think it was astrology. And there was a woman who was an astrologer out on the half moon Bay area of California. And she, she, she taught like a night course through adult education, you know, high school, right? They'll do stuff like that. I'm like, oh, astrology. That sounds interesting. Let me, let me go do that. 
so I signed up for the chorus. It was me and some other people. And uh, her name is Gloria. And she was a really, she was a really good teacher. She was a Virgo. And she started to put all the material together. And it was like, I just started to like, pick it up, right? It's like easy. It, it didn't, it didn't, it, it was like, I just knew it, right? It wasn't like I was learning anything new. I just, I just knew it. And then, so that was astrology. And, and I didn't really do anything with it because I had, a, I, had a, I had a gig, but it was part of like learning these systems. And then the next system I learned was numerology. I became obsessed with numerology. Um, and then making connections with astrology and numerology because that's part of the deal. And then I became obsessed with the runes. And I, again, it was, the runes were just something I kind of knew. It's like, I went through the little book by Ralph Bloom, right? And to this day, I could probably name all the runes, you know, pretty pretty easily yeah <laughs> yeah so you know it was it was like okay i started to learn all these systems but i didn't really learn them it was more like i was relearning them uh so astrology was the first stop on that that trail and then i think probably the final stop was um combination of two things uh one was my connection with karen lundergaard who you talked about uh, briefly in my intro karen was a wonderful trans medium like the real deal you know she she wasn't she she wasn't um like a poser and karen had come out of the uh you know the engineering world i mean that was her background and she had this psychic <clears throat> opening and psychic awakening so you know i was living in berkeley and i didn't really know what to expect um, but that was a time when I would get like readings from people. So I went to go see Karen and she lived in a, a craftsman bungalow in Berkeley, very normal person, super normal person. And she took me into her office where she did her readings and it, it blew my mind, right? She went into a trance and the house started to like creak and pop. And she was having like a dialogue with what was going on in the room. And and then she would even take on characteristics of people who had passed, and it really it really blew my mind. I'm like, wow, this 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 is really amazing, right? And she had this intuition that I would be I would be good at it. So she had a a course and on a psychic you know awareness, and so I enrolled in her course, and that was a mind blower because it was like, wow, I can. I can do these things, right? Like most, I, I think everybody's psychic. Some people are more psychic than others. And you can actually see that in the chart. And we have different ways of knowing. Some people are kinesthetic. Some people are somatic. Some people are, you know, telepathic. So we, we have a lot of different modalities that we can understand our reality, but they're not always the same. You could actually see that in charts in a lot of ways. I kind of graduated from that. And then I, then I got into the tarot. My it, back in the early part of the '90s, my my first wife had given me a tarot deck, and again, it was one of those things I just learned. It was easy. It was easy. And then my, and then I had a girlfriend during a little bit later during that time, and she gave me the Crowley deck, and the Crowley deck is embedded with astrological symbols. So I was connecting astrology with tarot, and then I got a gig as a psychic, a telepsychic, and that, I did that for about maybe about a year, which was really interesting. And then I, I left that. And I just, I was just doing tarot readings for people, but astrology was a part of it. Like I would look at the cards and I would see what was going on. And because there were, you know, and I, you could even, I could even do like an astrological wheel with the cards. And I remember one time I, I was with my, it was my first, my first real girlfriend. We had broken up and we hadn't seen each other in a long time, but we'd always have this really interesting like experience of running into each other it was so odd like she we would just years could go by and we would just run into each other in random places and uh in this and i'd gone on a like a van journey around the country reading tarot and i came back and i was doing my laundry at a at a, laun at a laundromat in san francisco and she walked by it was one of those random things and I, and I reached, I shouted out to her and she came back and she said, Hey, you know, do you want to, do you want to do a reading for me? Cause I told her what I did. And I said, yeah, sure. So I went to her house and I set up the, you know, the, and I had her pick the cards and, and I set up a wheel 
right? And I put the the center card, in, her in the center. So I was looking at the relationship, like the squares and all the things that were going on with that. And <clears throat> I remember seeing this configuration and I, and I got the sense that her father was going to die. And, you know, it's a very heavy message to communicate to somebody. And I kept telling her, I said, look, I think you need to get really clear with your father. Like get really straight with your father. Cause, cause I think it's important. And I could see it. In, I could see it in the wheel. Right. But I, but you, it's, there's a lot of responsibility with this mm -hmm. and you, and I hate it when people make pronouncements that or can really impede with another person's journey and will like you have to be very delicate when you get into that territory because you're almost like you're playing God. Right. And, and I, and I, and I, I take that into account because, uh, you know, I don't want to play God. There's only, there's only one character that can play God and I could, I can be, and you could be, we can all be a part of that and unique expression of that in our own way, but we are, we, uh, we are, we are, but we're not that right. So we have to be very, very, for me, you know, judicious and, and kind of respectful of that. So I said that to her, I think maybe about four weeks later, she calls me up and she tells me her father died. And she told me the circumstances under which he passed away, which were really interesting um, it was his, he just retired. Death is in the air today, by the way, there's a, there's a, I don't know. It's a very interesting day for death. Oh, you I mean just, today? Yeah. I mean, there's something in the air about death huh. today. Like, uh, you know, I, I did my show and I was, you know, I was looking at, I'll get back to the story. Sure. But you know, but, uh, there's you know, the football player who collapsed. Mm -hmm. It's really big news, right? Really big news. And, and, and there are a lot of different things that are associated with like, you know, was he vaccinated? And there's all these different things. And, um, but ultimately, and I, you know, and I follow sports and, and nobody's really hitting the message. Right. And the, the, the message around this is that there's all this care and all this concern and prayers and prayers. And I get it. Right. I, and I, I think you, that can be really important, but, it, but I think people are doing that more for themselves than they are for this individual. Right. Because we're so uncomfortable with death and you know, we'll do everything that we can in order to dress it up or Christianize it or whatever, whatever. Right. We've cast it out. It's death has been cast out. Yes, it has been cast out. And that's a problem. Because you get people acting out of folk concern, you, you know, traditions and rituals they don't even understand. And if we were, if we were right with it, right? If we were right with death and that happened, our response to that event would be very, very different. Very different. And one of the reasons, and you know, We'll get, I'll get back to my story, but one of the reasons why, you know, we're being led around by our noses is because people are terrified of death Absolutely. and, and just go back and look at what happened at the beginning of the COVID crisis. People were terrified. Mm -hmm. And when they're terrified, they're easily traumatized and led around. Mm -hmm. And until we can reconcile our relationship with that, we will never, ever be free on this planet. End of story, right? And then we and you deal with these, you know, whatever these entities are, you know, th their charges go through things like the cremation of care. So, you know, they're killing their spirit, right? So they have a relationship with death in a negative way that we don't. And that's why they can do whatever they want to do because they don't fucking care. Pardon my language, but Anyway, uh, there, there's just this thing. I can feel it in the air today. Hmm. There, there, there's something in the air about about it. It's funny. I just I had, before we got on the show, I had this client, and one of the things I work with in one of the readings that I do is the uh, Arguez dream spell. Mm -hmm. 
And this client is 13 Kimi. And Kimi is a symbol of death in you know, the day signs. And 13 is the end, right? So it's like, wow, that's interesting. Anyway, so her father passed away. And it was, a, it was a very interesting moment. But that's the astrology stuff really came into play with that. You know, because I was looking at, you know, the cards, the energy, the wheel. And I, again, I just kind of filed that. So astrology was always kind of in the, the back, right? It was always in the back of my head. But at that time, I was really doing a lot of tarot. I was getting hired out a lot. I had clients all over the country. It was really interesting. And then I wound up going into dot-com world for about five years. And so I did that and it was cool. It was a music thing, which I love and had a background in. So that wasn't that hard. I mean, it was for a corporate gig. It was, it was, you know, it was good. I, but I would always like, you know, ask people their signs or I could guess their signs, cute little parlor trick. But um, th so I did that. And then I, I got married, had a kid. Um, so I got off that track. And then I wound up getting another job with another company kind of in the same field. And it, it just didn't work out. It was like, I was done with that world. And during that time, I was going through a Saturn transit through my eighth house which again is like a death, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was dying from my old job and my old life and the new one hadn't really emerged yet. So I wound up getting uh, laid off from this other company, didn't really know what to do, um, was kind of fooling around with the blog. And this was when uh, Sarah Palin was named as John McCain's running mate. So I'm like, well, who is this person? Where'd she come from? Let me look at her chart. I know what I'll do. I'll do a, I'll do an ast astrological post about her on my on my on my blog. So I found, I think I I think I figured out when she was born, although there wasn't any time for her. So I had to kind of piece it together. Like, uh, let me figure this out. Let me see if I can put this together. So I did this chart and this interpretation on Sarah Palin. And then I looked at my stats on my blog and they went through the roof. I'm like, whoa, what's happening here? Maybe I should do more astrology. So that's what I did. And what happened was that there was this woman, uh, I had her on my show a couple of weeks ago. Her name is Elsa Elsa. She's a blogger and she's still around. You know who she is? Yes. Yeah. 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 So she, you know, she was just getting RSS feeds and she picked up my blog and you know, I started to get a lot of people coming over and other people began to discover my blog because um, I was writing about astrology in a very different kind of way. And so it really took off and I didn't have any, I didn't have any real goals to do readings for people at the time. Like that was, it, it, I just wanted to write about it. And then this woman reached out to me for a reading and I'm like, Oh, well, I guess I got to do this now. So I, I did my first reading I, and I know this person, I knew her for a while. We had a bit of a falling out during the beginning of the Trump era, but, but I, I'm, again, I'm grateful for the fact that she reached out and I did a reading for her. It's like, well, shit, I better, I better do this because there seems to be a thing. Right. So then I wired up my blog to take PayPal payments and whole nine yards. And I started to get clients. It just started to happen. And then it really, began to take off. Uh, this was in 2008, 2009. Pluto went into Capricorn. And I thought to myself, oh, man, this next 15 years is going to be really hard. So let me let me dive in and let me write about it. So I did. I did a about like a nine-part series on Pluto and Capricorn called The Melting Economy. And I looked into kind of where things were going. Um some of the stuff that I talked about and predicted came true, like people moving back home with their parents, um, you know, more kind of financial burden limitations. There were other things too. So yeah, I just started to get more clients and more clients. And then eventually, I guess it might've been around 2010, maybe 2010, maybe 2010 or 20, I think it was 2010. I started to do uh, podcasting, right? 
And I think my third guest was Jay Widener. And um, I was really into like Jay's work with uh, Stanley Kubrick and what he was decoding from that. So I, I, that was like the beginning of my relationship with Jay. And that would surface or resurface, I think in 2014, about 2013. So about two years later, and that would lead to my going to Gaia TV. And I think I did, I think I did 24 episodes. Not all of them were up. I think they took down at least one, maybe more. But I did that. And that was a really uh, good and interesting experience uh, for me to do that. And and then I, I think I, 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 I did my last show there. And I would go there. I would do like, like maybe four. I'd go there for like two days, maybe three days. And I would do anywhere between three to four shows. So I might do two in one day, come back and do two the next day. And I remember the last time I was there, I thought to myself, I think I'm done here. I just had that feeling that I was done. And I didn't know if, if it had to do with the fact that I was done being able to talk about things that were relevant or my content. It turned out it was my content because I did a show on Obama and uh, they didn't like that. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so that, I mean, the other thing too, is that the, the marketing department of Gaia didn't know what to do with me because, you know, I was, I was, I wasn't warm and fuzzy. So there were some people that liked me and other people were like, who is this guy? I don't know. He seems, you know, I kind of, I kind of, I was in like a bucket, right? I was in like the white male bucket. And there were a lot of millennials and I love millennials. Don't get me wrong, but there were a lot of millennials, a guy at the time. And I think they were like, no, not him. Right. <laughs> but you also, Robert, and I think this is a gift, but you, you touch on subjects that like general public doesn't really want to necessarily look at. Like you have, I, I had someone, I, I tell this story before about how, a uh, teacher many years ago said to me, <clears throat> she said, you are a black eyed seer. You see the shit. You see the stuff people don't want to see. Well, you're a black eyed seer. <laughs> like you and man, you just zero in. And not everyone is ready for what you can see, which I think is kind of the plight of the seer mm. history. I think, yeah, you're right. And I, I would I would agree with that. Although it seems, it really seems like the times are catching up to me. Oh, yes. Right. The times are definitely catching up to me because it's just all out there now. Mm -hmm. And the, the um, let's call it the spiritual IQ of people, I think is really accelerating and growing. And the amount of people that are doing decoding and uh, even the, the astrological world for a long time, I was like one of the few people that kind of had a, a a dissimilar approach from mainstream astrologers who tend to be much more progressive and new agey. I'm, I'm like, I'm not into that, you know? Um, but now there are, there are more people who are kind of heading in the other direction. And, uh, you know, I'd like to think that I might've played a little bit of a role in that because, and I think it's good. I think it's really good that other, that people are stepping out and, working with this and looking at this in, in a different way than sort of the rote models. But yeah, I mean, that was a, that was after I left Gaia, I was really, I was kind of bummed out actually, you know, you know, it was like, man, I really, I really liked going there. It was really good money. And, my, and so I had to, and there was some other stuff that was going on that I had to work through just for me personally. And, and eventually I got there, but that led me to, like, well, what are you going to do? You, you got to start streaming, right? So I started to stream. Uh, I mean, I was already doing podcasts. I did done a ton. And you and you were on my podcast. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Years ago. <laughs> I think it was twenty. I think it was twenty thirteen when you came on my podcast. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Right. And I remember getting your book and going to the pool and reading your book. <laughs> and I'm like, man, this person's really interesting, and she's a very good writer. Right. I'm looking forward to this. So I had learned a lot of Gaia because when I first started off, you, you're very conscious of the camera, very conscious. 
and I go back and I've watched the shows. I go, oh man, I I've got to change the ums and the ands, and and, and I got to change this. So I became very conscious of connecting my words in ways that were, um, you know, not uh, <laughs> disconnected, right? So by the time I did, by the time I finished that, it was easier for me on some level to do the streaming because it was almost like guy was a training ground for that. And so that was good. That was good. Uh, and I did my course during that time. I've got a 16 hour course in astrology, which I think is a really good course. Yeah. I want to take that course. I want to take that course. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me ask you, Robert. So this is, I want you to talk about kind of astrology is it's it's like a it's like a program it's almost like a computer program like i've explained yeah. to different clients that i've worked with that it's i i tell them look you were born and that moment that you entered this planet uh, this world the planets are always moving and in that moment it's like a snapshot and 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 whatever position those planets were in forms a kind of blueprint like a, a kind of pattern right that you're born into and I would love for you to speak to that because I think it is so important to have your birth chart done never mind the transits as later but like to have your birth chart it's like a window into the deeper layers of the persona that you're playing so I'll just let you take it from there it's really funny today there was a young guy who um I've been in touch with since right around 2013 and I, I, I think I did a couple of readings for him during that. I didn't know how young he was at the time. I think I did, but kind of glossed over it. Um, and I didn't know, but, but he was like this YouTube sensation. And he, he had a, a video that he had, he had done about um, multidimensionality and time travel. And that video got like 3.5 million views. And so we've stayed in touch over the years. And so today he asked me like, well, you know, why do we call the sun a planet? You know, it's not a planet. And it seems like it's more about being on earth. So I had to sit down and kind of just give him a little thumbnail lesson. And why the sun is important is because where it is both in the particular sign not the not the constellation but the particular sign that it's in and where it is in your chart is that it illuminates your potential in this lifetime that's what the sun does it illuminates your potential so we take that away from the sun when you're born you have a rising sign and what that indicates is the sign that was rising, not the constellation, because we're talking Placidus and not sidereal, the sign that was rising at the time of your birth, right? And that sign at the time of your birth sets the entirety of your chart. So it's a really interesting system. And a lot of people will say, oh, that's not astrology. You know, sidereal astrology is astrology. That follows the constellations, right? And there's 13 signs and on and on and on, right? So you'll You'll get arguments from purists, which I have to engage with from time to time. Uh, the, the, our version of astrology was created by a guy named, by the name of Ptolemy, who's an Egyptian, and he resets everything. So it's it's 12 signs, 360 degrees. So it's a perfect circle. And the astrological wheel and the astrological new year starts with Aries, which is the beginning of spring. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So for me, how, how I experience astrology in the Placidus version and model of astrology is that it is almost like a program. And I've talked about how as, as a system, part of it is what we've put into it, right? Our own beliefs in a lot of ways have helped curate astrology, right? Like when you, when you think of AI and, and if you do certain things enough, right? AI will pick it up. It, it will become 
maybe at some point like self-recognizing. And I feel like there's a lot of things like that on this planet, just in general. And astrology, I think is one of those things. There's other elements to it. You get into like um, Steiner and, and Casey and, you know, they talk about the energies of the spheres. And so they're, 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 they're kind of dropping into the cosmic potential of these planets. Right. And we know that if you follow a certain model that, you know, these planets are discovered at certain times because there's perturbations in the field. So the discovery of um, Uranus has a lot to do with witnessing and observing Saturn. Saturn would do things. It would fluctuate, right? And so, well, why is Saturn fluctuating? Well, maybe there's something beyond Saturn that's making it fluctuate. Oh, look, here's Uranus, right? So that's essentially how Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto were discovered. There was perturbations in the field. So if that's true, right, there are perturbations in the field. That means these planetary bodies are, are affecting one another in some ways. So we can extrapolate that and begin to think about, well, are they affecting us, right? And how does a little tiny planet that's not even a planet like Pluto theoretically affect us? Well, that's a really, really interesting question. You know, maybe it has something to do with Pluto and what it's composed of, you know, or maybe there's a relationship with Pluto um, on another dimensional level that we're not aware of that makes it something much. And I've heard this before, right? Like I've heard that if you saw Jupiter, you know, on a pair on a parallel reality, say fourth, fifth dimension, Jupiter, it would look really, really different, right? It would have a different kind of, of manifestation. Yeah. Right. And who's to, and, and again, we're kind of in this unknown territory where we don't necessarily understand the, the different dimensional representations of these spheres and even how they feed into the third dimensional kind of cognition of them. So, you know, the spheres become these kind of energy bodies, right? Then And then you get into like the cosmology of them. And, you know, even the cosmology of Saturn is really interesting. Like Saturn at one time was thought to be the original sun of our solar system. And Saturn, the light that Saturn emitted was purple, it was this purple light. And then Saturn gets shut down, the rings come around Saturn, and then we have a new sun. And the new sun is our current sun. Jupiter, theoretically, has been positioned to become the next sun after. Right? So there's all these really interesting like stories and, and, and myths that kind of feed into it. And the Saturn one is fascinating, right? Cause you think of Saturn and like, you know, the purple sun goes black and we associate the color black with Saturn. Um, so yeah, I mean, astrology, I mean, to, for me, astrology has been a very interesting tool and a map. There's also kind of the archetypal expressions of astrology when you look at you know something like mars you know what mars represents archetypally pluto again the underworld you know um i, re I remember uh you introducing me to um Karyotis, right so i did i did i think one show with Karyotis, mm -hmm. and then you know her book was just really outstanding yeah and um I'm like, well, let me look at Carrie's chart, you know, because there's this whole kind of relationship with the underworld with Carrie's chart. And lo and behold, she's got this Venus Pluto square in her chart, right? It's like, oh, hello, Mickey Rourke, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, taking her down into the underworld. And that's archetypal, right? So she she was living an archetypal expression of her chart with that Venus Pluto square. Now, not everybody's going to go through that, but she went through it. And when you read her book, you know, the specter, the specter of death plays a very big role in her life. Like the, the death of her high school boyfriend, I'm not saying anything that's out of bounds. She writes about it. Right. Yeah. And, and how that really just completely puts her life on tilt. Um, so yeah, the, the archetypes are really important and the mythologies are, are really important. And then you get into things like, like, you know, I, you know, um, 
astro mysticism. So for instance, we have a, we're in a Mercury retrograde now. And I saw this um, image of these doctors in France who are throwing their stethoscopes away because they have seen the light, right? They've seen the light. So when you look at Mercury, the symbol for the AMA is the caduceus, which is also the symbol of Hermes Trismegistus. And Hermes, of course, being a representation of Mercury. Doctors are professionals. They're very Capricornian. You have three years left to live, right? That's a very time-oriented kind of thing. So I'm like, here we go. Mercury retrograde. Doctors are throwing their stethoscopes away because they, so that's, to me, that's when astrology gets really, really interesting. And we get to see things externalized that have this very symbolic relationship with aspects that are going on. And, you know, without fail, you and I were talking about like, is it a science there's some science that's related to you need to know kind of math and angles and you, the, you kind of navigate and move around the wheel a little bit. Um, you could probably get into like elemental properties, you know, sulfur. Uh, I think sulfur is related to Mars. So you, you, you can play with stuff like that. Right. And, but there's also like the art of astrology because it, it, I think it's an art and there's a, Very much so if I could interject, I knew, yeah, yeah. um, I did, a, I led a couple of tours in Ireland and my my partner out there, John Wilmot, he's a lovely man, he's in his late sixties. And he was an astrologist before computers and, and he got so good at it. He told me he gave a reading to someone. And then years later, I think he was, he was on a little boat over to going over to Mull in Scotland. And he was chatting, just chatting with this lady. And then all of a sudden he said, I think I read for you like years ago. And she was like, wait, what? He recognized her face through what he remembered. Oh, of that's heart. powerful. That's uh, powerful. Well, and, but this is why I think astrology is so important because, because of that very thing. Yeah. It, 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 it explains so much more than we could even explain. <laughs> we could even think possible. So was he on his way to Iona? Yes. Yeah, nobody goes to Mull. <laughs> that's true thank you he's like you're correct i i realized that when i was when i was saying that um yeah he i think he worked on iona he did some work on iona i've been it, to, i've been to iona so have i so have yeah. i what a place wow oh i love it there i love it so much scotland's my my happy place iona's really powerful mall is a different kind of power yeah 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 uh, anyway yeah. we progress <laughs> a little bit but yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, astrology is <laughs> blowing up. It's totally blowing up. Uh, Gen Z loves astrology. They Which is it. great. I mean, it's been how long? I mean, do you think astrology has been around for thousands of years, probably thousands of years and it's rocking right now. Oh, it's huge. It's huge. I, I think it's more relevant than ever at this time. Absolutely. So why, why would, what, what would you tell, why should someone get their chart done, their birth chart done? What, what does that do for someone? What does that offer them? So charts are like operating systems. They're like operating systems. And if, and if you don't understand your operating system, you're not fully informed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I dabble in human design a little bit. And m most of the populace are, are generators. And generators need to understand their operating system. Whether it's from human design or astrology, they need to understand it. And uh, so understanding your operating system is key. And, you know, if you, you understand what your potential is and what your limitations are. And a lot of people say, oh, we're limitless beings. Well, in theory you are, yeah. But, you know, there are certain things where they show up in the chart. You go down a certain alley that you're not supposed to go down. Your, your chart's not going to be effective, right? It's not going to be, as impactful. And in fact, you could actually undermine yourself. And, and there are plenty of examples of that. So the idea with astrology, you, got, you have to figure out kind of where you fit inside of your own life and how to maximize that. And some charts are very difficult. Some charts are, you know, really, 
amazing or whatever i mean there's no they're like snowflakes there's they're all they're all different unless you meet somebody that's born in the exact same day as you in the exact place right an exact time but even that like with twins there's a slight difference with twins too right right i i've often said that that you want to realize how unique you are start looking into the birth chart because yeah it's so radically different yeah and the idea is, is to not is to you know to be on the same page with your birth chart not fight it and, and to under, understand um just how it unfolds so for me personally i i've had lessons in my life surrounding that and i work a lot with the nodes like the true node and the south node and i have the south node in pisces in my fourth house and um you know i, I have a son and i've been married a couple times but and i love my son and i thought i, I thought for the most part I, I was a good dad um you know they're they're you know every parent trips and falls and stumbles. Right. But I thought for the most part, I was a good dad. And I would say that my uh, attempt to have a family was not great. And it has to do with my South node. It's in the fourth house, which is home and family. And, um, you know, the strength of my chart is my true node, which is where you're supposed to head in this lifetime. Is South node indicating the past? It's indicating the past. And, you know, the, and my, my, my relationship with the notes has changed a little bit, but I'm still in the camp of you don't want to live your life from the South Node. You live your life from the South Node. You're, you're basically trying to shoot an arrow in reverse. And it never works. Now, if you have planets around the South Node, that's a bit of a different story. But I don't. So, you know, I, for me, my true note is in Virgo. Uh, conjunct the midheaven in my 10th house. So in this lifetime, I need to be of service, right? I need to be in the world. And that was always sort of in conflict in, in my, in, in the marriage that I was in with my son, because, we, you know, we were at kind of cross purposes with that. And so that, uh, you know, ultimately it, it, you know, it ended the way that it ended. And then I had to continue my journey to the 10th house, which it, it is what it is, right? But, but when you understand that, you can make peace with that. Right. And you you can align yourself with, you know, where the direction is in this lifetime for you. So, I mean, that's just one, you know, one kind of micro example. And for, for me, I used to, uh, I've got planets in the 11th house. They're all, they're in Libra, so I you know I would hang out with a lot of musicians, and um, some of my some of my friends, the eleventh house, were, were musicians, and I and I was good at kind of marketing and selling their stuff. I understood their music and everything, and so I thought to myself, well, this will be a niche for me. I can I can do this. Right, I'll set this up, and and I was moderately successful. I was more successful for them than I was for me, and it wasn't really until. I got into astrology as a profession that that all shifted. Mm. And then I, I realized it's like, okay, this is what I need to do. I need to, I need to do it, it's such a cliche. I need to do me. Right. And 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 it was it took me really until I was about 50 to really figure that out. And I'd gone through my Chiron return and then everything began to set in my chart. And by understanding astrology, you can get to that faster. Right, because it's really like it's like a heads up. It's like here's a heads up for your life. These are the influences. This this is maybe where you're weak. This is where you're stronger. This area needs work. You're going to really excel here. I mean, that's hugely helpful. Right. I uh, absolutely. And there are times, even when you're going through something, you know, sometimes awareness can be helpful. It doesn't always change what you're going through right? Your relationship to that thing and what you bring to the table will change it. Could you speak to, because we've been talking, you've been talking about Saturn. Just just give a, like an overview of what is the Saturn return that happens at the age of around 29. And then I'm in my second Saturn return. Let's talk about the first one, just to give people an, an idea of what that's all about. 
So it takes Saturn 28 and a half to 29 years to come back to where it was uh, when you were born. So that's called the Saturn return. And you'll, an individual will go through a Saturn return, maybe, maybe three times in their life. All right. If you, if you're kind of lucky enough to stick around for the third Saturn return, and of course it happens. Jupiter, Jupiter returns happen every 12 years. Mars returns every two years. Um, Uranus return happens 74. It's a 74 year cycle. So by the time you get to your Saturn return, you've already gone through significant Saturn transits. Saturn represents like limitation. Saturn is the father that says no all the time. Isn't Saturn also though the sage and Saturn? I usually say like Saturn's no fuck around, fuck around, but Saturn will reward you richly. I think maybe at the end, you know, like because you got her done right and proper instead of say like Neptune, which could be a little. Well, yeah. I mean, Saturn, Saturn and Jupiter are very interesting because of their proximity with one another. But yeah, I mean, Saturn is the father that says no, mm -hmm. it, you know, no, don't no, you can't do that. Go do this. You know, this will make you a better person, right? It'll, right. it'll make it. And so, man, I could go on and on about Saturn, but it, 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 it is, it is, it is the, uh, it is the devil in the chart, hmm. but it is also liberating. Once you, once you understand Saturn and once you go through a, a significant Saturn transit, you'll be grateful for it. Like if you really understand it, you'll be grateful for it. You're like, you know what? I really learned a lot. And the reward of, of Saturn is, you know, I would call it more incarnation, right? Like you're more here, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're more available kind of on this realm. And Saturn also, uh, is about limitations, right? You mentioned Neptune. There's like well, limits. There's no limit with Neptune, right? Right. So Saturn is limitations and boundaries, and um, limitations are, are, you know, they can be very good. Mm -hmm. If we don't have limitations, look at the world we're living in. We, we, you know, and it's really weird, like what's happened, just in terms of the the uh, personification of Saturn. Like I, I've gotten into this before. Um, you know, Saturn's the father. Mm -hmm. so, fa so when you're young, the son is the father when you're young, because, you know, you're a little kid and your father's playful and you wrestle and, you know, so it's fun. Right. But then as you get older, usually when you hit, the first Saturn square to your sun, which is around seven, seven, eight, right around there. The relation with the father begins to change. And the father begins to bring more limitations into your life. Go to bed early, eat your vegetable. You know what I mean? Did you do your homework? Stuff like that. Right? So then the father becomes Saturn because that's what the father is supposed to do. Of course, Saturn was at one point in time, theoretically the sun. So we have these two images of the sun, the light sunny sun and the dark winter sun with Saturn. And you hit your Saturn opposition at 14. And at 14, uh, people separate from their family and their father, right? Their cultural mm -hmm. um, locus defined by Saturn, they, they, they separate out at 14 which connects up with the endocrine system and adolescence. And so you have rebellion and you got to find your own kind of authority, right? At that point in time. And then at 21, you have the second Saturn square, which is a really important one because you're, you're no longer, you know, an adolescent, you know, it's like, if you're not growing up by the time you hit that second Saturn square, you're going to have something that's going to force you to grow up. And that happened to me. And a lot of people have a spiritual crisis at 21. Hmm. And that spiritual crisis is supposed to set you up
for the Saturn return. The Saturn return is kind of like, okay, here's your test. How well have you done? Are you ready to move into the next phase of your life, which is maturity and, you know, joining the community and, you know, be, being able to be responsible because that's what Saturn represents is responsibility. So you kind of get tested on your Saturn return. And for a lot of people, they go into something that changes their lives and gives them more structure and eliminates certain things that they've done. So for instance, uh, yeah, I met my wife in her Saturn return. So what, what happened? She got married and shortly there, she, we got a house and then she got pregnant, right? Those, those are all major Saturn return pieces, major Saturn return pieces. So she, you know, theoretically, she really did her Saturn return. She, she did it right. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, because she did all those things. Yeah, I did the same thing at that age. I tried. I failed miserably. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> I'll blame it on the south note. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, you get to your Saturn return. And when I was growing up, this is like pre Findhorn. You know, I was, I would, I would, people would ask me, how old are you? And I'd say, well, I'm 22, 23. Oh, you haven't gone through your Saturn return yet. That's funny. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell is this Saturn return thing? And every time somebody would talk about it, it would be like, oh. <laughs> so preloaded in my consciousness, I'm like, oh, oh, right, Saturn return. Um, and there still is a lot of that in our awareness around Saturn. And when I work with people, because Saturn is kind of an interesting planet in my chart. I have it in Capricorn. So it's in its own sign. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I've come to appreciate Saturn. And I try to work with people in a way where it's like, don't be afraid of this. Right. That's right? good. Let, like, go, go into it with a sense that you're, you're, you're on a path of mastery. And you, and you have to, at times, submit to what you don't know and Saturn will help you with the tools, but you have to humble yourself with Saturn. You have to humble yourself. You can't, Oh yeah, I got this. Yeah. No, yeah. You can't know. You have to humble yourself. Say, you know, I'm not really sure about my ability to kind of, you know, handle it. Let me find out. Let me, let me put one foot in front of the other. Let me take my time. And th that's what Saturn does. Like Jupiter will puff you up and Saturn will knock you down. And I remember when I was 21, I was, I was in this class in college and boy, I thought I knew it all. Right. And I started spouting some bullshit and the teacher just cut me down to size. Like, where in the text is that? Point that out. Right? And I'm like, oh, shit. And I, man, was that a Saturn moment or what? And, and, and again, it was a teacher, right? It was authority. That was the first Saturn square. Mm. And what did I do? Uh, I went to the back of the class. I shut the fuck up. And I just listened for the rest of that semester. Just listened. Like I, I, I had to admit what I didn't know and right. I was never going to be made to feel foolish again. Right. Yeah. But that so would the, grow up a bit, wouldn't what's it? That? That would what's grow that? up a bit, you know, that yes. would force you to mature. Absolutely. Right. And, and I really had to humble myself during that period because I changed majors um, and you know, I was, I, I was a TV kid growing up. I just, I watched thousands of hours of TV. And so that was my major when I was in junior college. I was really, really good at it. Cause I mean, that's all I did was watch TV. Um, and then I left that because I had an experience, which was interesting. And I went to uh, university and I was, I was in search of a new major. I didn't know what to do. All I knew is I didn't, I wasn't sure if I wanted to go back into media 
And so I met this woman who was really interesting, really, really interesting. And um, I'm like, well, what do you do? And she says, well, I'm an English major. And I'm like, oh, well, I like hanging out with you. You're really smart. Let me, let me check some of this out, right? So I became an English major. And I was at such a deficit because I didn't really, I mean, I read, but I didn't read a ton. I read some books, but not classics. Like I, I would read shit like um, The Exorcist or um, <laughs> Starship Troopers, like Heinlein, some science fiction, Arthur C. Clarke. I would read stuff like that, but I, I didn't read the classics. Like I didn't read Dickens. And so when you're an English major, you got to go through a lot of this stuff. And I was, uh, I was in with people that was their world, right? They read in high school and they were avid readers and, and I'm like, wow, you know, I've got to, like, I don't like to compete directly, but I knew that I was, you know, in, in heavy water with people that knew how to swim. And, and I didn't really, I was really shaky. So I, again, Saturn, and I just became dedicated and focused and I read everything I could. Like, so part of the, whatever the curriculum was, I read, but I was also reading on the side just to catch up. Right. So I was going into like Jung and Joseph Campbell um, and, you know, and I, I would study the surrealists and anything that I, it was, I was like machine learning during that time. And, uh, that was Saturn. Like that was a Saturn moment. Like I, I had to really, had to really, really buckle down. And I even, I had some really amazing moments during university because, because I had to humble myself and, uh, you know, it's, 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 that's an ongoing practice and art of life. Um, so that you don't get smacked down and, and, but at the same time, you, you just can't be anybody's doormat too, because that's not the true definition of humility. Um, right. So Saturn, Saturn will, will bring you into that world. But if you, if you pass the test, Saturn will reward you too. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. Well, we are, we're at the end of the first half, Robert. So okay. Uh, I will invite listeners to go to the website, mushroomsprentice.com and subscribe, and you can listen to the full two hours of this and other episodes. And Robert, I would love for you in the second half to talk about the planetary influences on our world. And certainly there's a lot, a lot going on astrologically now. We're living it, and this is huge, and I'd love to hear what we can expect through 2023 and into 2024, you know, let's just, you know, have you kind of riff on that. Sure. So great. Okay. And so thank you everyone and hope to see you for the second hour.